Hi gang, Jeff McAleer here, and this is going to be the first in my proposed new series of videos to help people paint miniature figures. Now, I've been painting minis for over 30 years, and it's a blast. I love it. It's very relaxing, and you'd be amazed at just how creative you can get with these little metal and plastic figures. Now, I see a lot of people playing miniatures games at different game days and conventions, and one thing that always strikes me is the number of people who are playing these systems and games with unpainted figures, or those that are just simply with a base coat. Now, to me, that really takes away a lot of the appeal of playing miniatures games, because it's the whole visual spectacle as well as the tactile experience of playing with these little soldiers, I guess we would say, which really gives the hobby its panache. I tend to ask people who are playing with unpainted miniatures, why aren't they painted? And I get a variety of different answers, but mainly those boil down to, one, it's too difficult, two, it's too expensive and time consuming, and three, I don't want to mess up my miniatures. Now, taking that into account, I've never claimed to be some master miniature painter, anything like that, but I have been able to put together some really nice looking miniatures and probably of a little higher quality than just game table painting. And that's what this whole series of videos is going to be about. How to easily get into miniature painting, present really nicely painted miniatures for you to play with, but at a fraction of the time and cost involved in presenting huge masterpiece miniatures. And don't get me wrong, there are some fantastic award-winning miniature painters out there. I just simply am not one of them. But stay tuned. Every couple of weeks or so, I'm going to have a brand new video, and we're going to go deeper and deeper into various techniques of painting, basing your figures, using color theory, and so forth. All pretty much for the average miniature painter out there. So here's the first installment, Tools of the Trade. Let's begin by approaching what I consider to be the tools of the trade. Now keep in mind that this series of videos isn't designed for those people out there who have years of experience painting miniature figures. This is for people who are thinking about getting into the hobby, how to go about presenting good quality tabletop miniatures, or better, without having to spend an arm and a leg to get started. So the first thing I always recommend is find an area that's got some good natural light. It doesn't have to be right out on your patio with the sun shining down or anything like that, but you want to try to get as much good natural light as you possibly can. That isn't always the case, of course, because many of us tend to paint our miniatures later in the evening, after work, Things along those lines, the sun has gone down. So at least stay in an area that's very well lit and have a nice comfortable spot for you to be able to paint in. Now sometimes you might not have enough light. You may have to go with an outside light source. So even possibly a clip lamp, something along those lines, probably with a lower watt bulb so you don't have a very garish amount of light. This I picked up for a dollar at a garage sale. So very easy there. Then I always like to make sure that I have something to cover my painting area with. A lot of times I'll use different ads I get in the mail. I especially like the paper that's been treated a little bit so it's a little slicker. You'll probably want to tape 
a couple of layers down on where you're painting. A lot of times people are doing it on a desk or a small table. You can use masking tape or probably more preferably painter's tape to be able to keep this in place so it doesn't move around and by using painter's tape you're not going to damage the surface of what you're painting on. I normally don't have a black cloth that I'm painting on because it sure wouldn't stay black for long. Something else I always recommend when you're getting ready to start painting is to make sure you've got plenty of entertainment on hand. Make sure you've got plenty of your favorite DVDs available or Netflix or something that's going to to keep your mind occupied a little bit. Now I certainly don't recommend going out and renting the, the latest hit Hollywood movie that you've been dying to see because you don't want to have that distraction going on. So I recommend utilizing movies from your collection or things that are on Netflix or Hulu or anything along those lines that can be playing in the background, kind of occupy your mind a little bit, but it won't be a complete distraction. A matter of fact, some of these uh, movie packs that you can get at the big box stores, especially if you're painting historical miniatures, World War II miniatures, things along those lines, come in really handy. I have to point out, I painted loads and loads of 15 millimeter American Civil War figures and I could probably quote Ken Burns' The Civil War documentary verbatim, practically. It always helps to have movies that are going to be somewhat along the subject matter of what you're painting. So fantasy movies, historical movies, science fiction movies, things like that. You'll find that if you don't have something going on in the background, even if it's music or talk radio, that you'll become kind of bored after a while just painting the miniatures. So now once again I'm going to point out these are just my thoughts on the topic on the subject of painting miniatures. I'm sure there's plenty of people who are going to completely disagree with me but then again it's an art it's not a science in painting miniatures. So make sure you've got something to uh, kind of play in the background. One aspect of painting miniatures that is probably some of people's least favorites is going to be the prep work. But you need to take time prepping your miniatures before you start laying down the paint. Otherwise, you are not going to get the kind of results that you'll hope for. And you don't want to become discouraged. But I will point out that even the worst painted miniatures on the tabletop are much better than the plain plastic or metal or just primed figures that people will play with. In my opinion, what's the use of utilizing miniatures if you're not going to paint them? So I'm going to zoom out a little bit. We're going to take a look and I'm going to bring in quite a few different items that a lot of them you're going to be able to find around the house or you'll be able to run out to the local big box store and pick up very, very cheaply. In your prep work, you're going to want to have a variety of different cutting tools to utilize, especially if you're working with metal miniatures, a hobby knife, especially when you're trying to get rid of mold lines, the back end of a hobby knife works very, very well. Just various different kinds of clippers, scissors, and so forth, because a lot of miniatures are going to have what they call flash, which is excess material, a lot of metal, uh, plastic even, or they'll have mold lines, which you want to eliminate those as well. So you want to have just a variety of different tools that will allow you to cut through that plastic or through that metal. Now, you have to be very careful when you're prepping, and of course I'll talk about this when I do the video about prepping your figures, because you don't want to take off too much metal or damage the plastic because then you don't have a miniature that you're going to be able to repair very easily. Also doing your prep work, you should have a set of files for metal figures. 
And there's a variety of different flat and rounded files in this set here, as well as a handle that you can utilize. Now, if you're painting plastic miniatures, you're going to want to get your hands on some plastic sanding needles. And they do come in various different grits as well. So you can go to a finer grit for really minor mold lines. I tend to even use on plastic sometimes the metal files, depending on what it is. Then you want to have a variety of different glues. You want to make sure you have white glue. This comes in especially handy when you're doing basing and putting flock or rocks or whatever you are on the bases of your miniatures, as well as super glue. Super glue always comes in handy. And I also recommend epoxy. A lot of times with some of the miniatures, especially metal ones, you'll have different pieces that need to be attached or you'll have areas that need to be filled because there's a seam. Epoxy, two-part epoxy works very well for that. I know they also sell green stuff, which is a sculpting compound that you can utilize too. Uh, I've used it in the past. I don't see a huge difference. I don't sculpt miniatures, so obviously I wouldn't need the green stuff. So epoxy works just fine. Then you're going to need something to hold your paints because you don't want to paint directly from the container for the paint because you're never going to get enough paint control on your brushes by doing that. You're going to end up loading down your brushes with too much paint which in the end is going to ruin your brushes. So there's a lot of different ways that you can go about holding your paints and mixing your paints. To start off you can easily use bottle caps. I think everybody in the world can get their hands on a bunch of bottle caps. Easily taken care of, you put a little bit of paint in there, a little bit of the material you're going to use to thin the paint if the paint needs to be thinned, and you've got it right there for you. Easily taken care of. Now once you start getting into the painting, you'll want to get a little palette uh, this is a very, very cheap plastic palette that you can utilize. I believe I picked it up at a craft store for about 99 cents. There are dry palettes. This is considered a dry palette. There are also wet palettes as well. I wouldn't recommend using a wet palette until you really get into painting miniatures. And even folks who have won numerous awards don't use wet palettes. Well, on the other hand, quite a few do. You also want a container that's going to hold some water. Sometimes you need to dip your brush into a little bit of water. I wouldn't use this to clean my brush, but just as a water reservoir, you can utilize that. Now, speaking of brushes, you don't have to go hog wild when you first get started with your painting. These are a set of brushes that were picked up at Walmart. I believe they were probably maybe three bucks in total to get started. I still utilize some of these brushes for dry brushing, which is a technique that's utilized to bring out more detail in your figures and to uh, add some depth as well. I certainly wouldn't use these brushes to begin actually laying down base colors or doing any kind of detail work. But to get started, something like these brushes should be fine. Now once you've begun to get some experience in painting your miniatures, then you're going to start looking at bringing in more fine detail brushes, such as this. These are available as packages of different fine tipped brushes. And once you get to the point where you're completely hooked, then you can start going, here's another set of just pretty inexpensive acrylic brushes. These would be for more fine detail work. But as I started to say, once you start getting really into the hobby, then you're going to start going out and purchasing individual brushes, depending on what you're going to be utilizing. Say, for an example, this brush here is for very, very fine detail. 
To start off, you don't need these kind of brushes, but they are available, they are pricier, and you're looking at buying each brush individually, and that you're going to go to an artist store or one of your finer craft stores to be able to pick these up. I also recommend having a color wheel. Reason behind this is you want to be able to see what colors complement other colors. There's a reason why some miniatures really pop and catch the eye, while others just seem somewhat off. And a lot of times it's because of the use of complementary colors. Also, you want to keep in mind when someone's trying to lighten a color or darken a color, you're not going to add white to lighten and you're not going to add black to darken. You're just going to have a complete and utter mess if you do something like that. So a basic color wheel comes in very handy. There are some books out there specifically for color coordination that can be picked up. Once again, that's something further down the line if you decide this is really something you want to get into. Speaking of paints, you don't have to go out there and spend an arm and a leg on Citadel or Vallejo or the Reaper line of paints. You can easily go to any big box store and pick up some acrylics in very base colors. They're very inexpensive. I will point out that these do tend to be thicker than what you'll find in the professional hobby paints. So a lot of times you're going to have to thin these out a little bit with either distilled water or tap water if you have to. Or a lot of times I'll see people, they'll go and they'll get airbrush thinner. It's uh, utilized to thin out paint for airbrushing. But if you use too much of that, you'll thin the paint out. You won't have any coverage. Sometimes some of these paints don't offer great coverage as well. But then again, you're probably looking at two ounces of paint for maybe 89 99 cents. One thing I will mention though is as far as these discount paints, I would stay away from their metallics because their metallics are usually terrible. Very, very unrealistic looking metallics. And a lot of times there's very, very little metallic to those paints. So those are the ones that you're going to want to take a look at going over to uh, an artist store or to your friendly local gaming store that does carry miniatures and pick up your metallics. Now, once you really find out that, hey, I'm super digging this, I'm having a blast painting these miniatures, then you want to start moving into the professional grade paints like Reaper's line, the Citadel, or Vallejo paints. But until that point, don't be blowing four or five dollars on a little bottle of paint when you can pick up a full spectrum of paints for about a hundred dollars. You don't even need the full spectrum. You just need the base colors from your color wheel and you'll be able to mix just about any color you'd like. I also recommend having yourself a little squeeze bottle of distilled water or tap water if you must, or this is what you would use for the airbrush thinner, because then you can squeeze just a little bit into your paint, mix it, and then get the consistency that you're looking for. A lot of times the paint consistency has a lot to do with are you trying to lay down a base color, is it a highlight, are you doing some shadowing? Is it a wash that you're putting down? Or even if you're dry brushing, you don't, when you're dry brushing, you don't want your paints to be very, very thin and watery because they're going to spread in areas that you don't want those to spread to. Speaking of paints and brushes, I always recommend picking up something along the lines of pink soap. And what you use this for is this is to clean your brushes. Your brushes are probably going to be one of the most important aspects of your miniature painting. And you'll be very surprised, or at least some folks will be, if you don't properly clean your brushes, you will ruin the brushes. They're going to lose their tips. They're going to fray apart. You're going to see 
stray strands all over the place, stray hairs, and that will ruin your painting. If you just use some pink soap, or you can even use dishwashing soap if you want. I don't necessarily recommend it, but make sure you clean your brushes. And then of course, the final tool of the trade that you'll need would be miniatures, obviously enough. And of course, they come in a wide variety of different manufacturers and genres, sizes. I've painted miniatures anywhere from six millimeters high all the way up to airbrushing one-sixth scale figures of movie monsters and girl kits and, and things along those lines. So I happen to be a big fan of Reaper. This isn't an advertisement for Reaper, but there are just a handful of companies out there that I feel really give you a lot of bang for your buck. I believe that they've seriously got their pricing down the way it should be. Reaper's one of those companies. So as this series goes on, you'll see quite a few Reaper figures as well as from a few other companies also. Last thing I'm going to point out that you'll probably want, especially if you're of my age, is some reading glasses. I know some people use a stationary magnifier to paint with, and of course that's all fine and good, but that's going to run you a bit of cash. Whereas you can go out and get a low-powered pair of reading glasses to, to help you with the finer details on the figure Personally, I just perch these on the end of my nose, and uh, when I'm looking down at the figure, I'm looking through the reading glasses, and if I glance up to see what was on TV or something, then I'm not. Then, of course, with the miniatures, we've got various different sizes as well. This is still a 28 millimeter figure, but it's a big old dragon. So, these are just some of the tools of the trade that I recommend you have before you get started into painting miniatures. If you go out there and you get inexpensive items, paints, so forth, you can probably get everything set up using you know, tools that are in your house too for your prep work. You can probably get all set to start laying down some paint on some miniatures, probably in a price range around $100. That'll get you some good brushes, some other materials as well, like your palette, your paint wheel, the paints, some miniatures, and so forth. Before I finish up, I forgot to mention that you're going to need paints to prime your figures once you finish the prep. Some people just use very inexpensive base paints, uh, black, white, gray. Others will go and they'll purchase sprays that are specifically designed for miniatures. Other people will go and buy small bottles of paint that's specifically made to be a primer. However you go about it is fine. Myself, personally, you're just starting out. You probably want to get two base coats, white and black, and they don't have to be expensive. I believe this can here was probably a buck at Walmart. The key to using the more inexpensive paints is very, very light coats. And of course, I'll talk about that when we get to the prep work. I also recommend having some sealer. It's a clear acrylic sealer. You want to go with a matte. What I tend to do is, after I've done some painting on a figure, I'll give it a light coat of the sealer. Just so later on, as I'm working on the figure, if I make a mistake, it's not as difficult to clean up that mistake on the miniature than if I wait till the end to seal the mini. You can get matte. There's also a semi-gloss. There's a gloss. A lot of times people go straight with a matte, but the matte has less protection than the glossier sealers. But it's a trade-off. So sometimes I'll take a semi-gloss, put a light spray on as a finished product, and then do a matte on top of that. So there you have it. The tools of the trade to get you started in the wonderful and really fun world of painting miniature figures. On my next segment, 
we'll talk about probably the least fun aspect, but no doubt one of the most important aspects of painting miniatures, prepping them for your paint jobs. Until then, this is Jeff McAleer. Thanks for joining me, and be sure to swing by thegaminggang.com for the latest in news, reviews, and opinion in the tabletop gaming world, and so much more. Have a good one.